I would like to thank the President for giving me the honor of speaking in this debate. When a government legalizes anything, there are a couple of basic rational assumptions that can be made. Firstly, that they believe there will be a net positive impact from doing so. Secondly, and this is particularly relevant when it comes to chemical products designed for human consumption, that the product itself is safe. I will endeavor to demonstrate that when it comes to presently illegal drugs, legalization fulfills neither of these objectives and would actually cause manifest harms, with these harms disproportionately affecting the young and vulnerable. I shall primarily cast focus upon marijuana, as is the drug often erroneously, in my opinion, perceived to be the safest, and therefore many people, no one really advocates for legalization of other drugs such as cocaine, LSD, but not marijuana. It seems relatively uncontroversial to say that young people have staggeringly high rates of mental ill health, whether it is depression, anxiety, debilitating stress, disorders of eating or mood. The word epidemic seems to be deployed an awful lot when characterizing the mental state of the youngest generations in our society. Indeed, in late 2021, the Surgeon General of the United States, the government's leading spokesman on public health, published an advisory illustrating that over the decade 2009 to 19, the percentage of 14 to 18 year olds who experienced frequent and recurring feelings of acute hopelessness and sadness rose by 40%, with more than one in three affected. Even more alarmingly, the proportion of students with serious su suicidal ideation increased by 36%, to one in five. Sixteen percent reported making an actual plan, that's up forty-four percent. The situation is similarly bleak in this country. According to the NHS, seventeen percent of six to nineteen-year-olds have a probable clinically diagnosable mental health condition, with over half experience, experiencing a deterioration in their everyday mental state since 2017. We're talking about multiple millions. Therefore, any rational change to drug laws would have to bear this in mind. Any drug, that is, a substance which has a physiological effect when brought into the body, will vary in effect according to the person taking it. Hence, different doses of medication based on age, sex, and body weight are given to hospital patients. This is a critical point. As the motion stands, the legalization of drugs would not make their consumption subject to medical supervision, but rather for personal use. The amount you take entirely at your, at your own discretion, there's nothing to stop you going to five different pharmacies all in one go. The potential for abuse is enormous. The brain does not finish developing until our mid-twenties, with the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex one of the last regions to mature. This area is responsible for impulse control. The brain's reward system is also far more active in adolescence than it is later in life, specifically at the time of puberty, after which it declines to an adult level at around 25. As a result of this, young people are far more predisposed than their elders to participate in risk-taking behavior without considering the potential consequences of this, particularly if it gives them a short-term high, literal or otherwise. Now consider, almost half of all mental health problems are established by the age of 14, 75% by 24, during this critical period of brain development. JAMA Psychiatry, a peer-reviewed medical journal published by the American Medical Association, recently analyzed 11 studies covering 23,000 people. They found that those who used marijuana before they were 18 were 37% more likely to subsequently develop clinical depression by the age of 32, and three times more likely to attempt suicide than those that did not. Not many of us would walk down an alleyway if we were 37% more likely to get mugged that night. These studies accounted for other mental health risks, and the head researcher estimated that 7% of depression cases in young people, that's about 60,000 in this country, were derived from teenage marijuana use. The Times estimates around one in 13 children aged 11 to 15, and one in six of 16 to 24 year olds use cannabis regularly. If these relatively small numbers of usage account for 7% of all cases of depression, legalization and the associated rise in usage would be catastrophic intensifying the public health crisis of poor mental health. But the negative health impacts don't stop there. THC, the psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, has also been repeatedly shown to be linked to a quintupling of the risk of developing psychosis. Isolated psychotic symptoms are prevalent up to among 15% of chronic users. Long-term use permanently impairs cognitive function, impacting focus, inducing neuroplasticity to actually alter 
reward-based learning, leading to features typical of addiction. It inhibits the working of the prefrontal cortex, thus increasing other risk-taking behavior with all of their associated neg negative consequences. If the part of your brain responsible for executive decision-making has been prevented from su sufficiently and normally developing due to teenage drug abuse, this will affect you neurologically for life. Again, young people's brains are by far the most liable to be altered in this way, and it would be grossly unethical to normalize such a substance in full knowledge that it would predominantly affect those who would be harmed the most by it. Legalizing drugs would both increase access to them and fuel normalization through an official stamp of approval, if you will. Even if an age restriction were to be implemented, it would still remove multiple barriers to underage purchase and consumption. Take any standard park, it will have played host to 12-year-olds there with Echo Fools and cheap beer. Legalizing drugs would create a culture of acceptability, perhaps even expectation to participate, with devastating ramifications. Drugs are more likely to be seen as desirable or attractive to those predisposed to view risky or unfamiliar behavior favorably. It just so happens that these people are those most likely to incur negative consequences from it. Advocates of drug legalization may point to Canada where marijuana was legalized in 2018, or the US where 19 states permit its re recreational, not just medical, but recreational use. However, what does this actually translate to in practice? Because we have heard the discussion of sort of a midway, tightly regulated market, but that's not actually what's happened in reality here. Consider the society we live in, not an ideal one, hyper-commercialized, driven, driven by profit, and ruthless market competition. The legalization of drugs would present a hugely lucrative opportunity. They come in a diverse array of forms and therefore products. Any company entering into a new market, which this would be, is looking to grow its consumer base. This is inherently the case in, the com in any commercial industry. It's not wrong in itself. But in this case, legalization of drugs for personal use would amount to the government encouraging companies to actively target those who are perceived to be the most receptive to trying drugs and making repeat consumers out of them. When it comes to drugs, which are currently illegal, being a repeat consumer is all but synonymous with being dependent or an addict. Perhaps the proposition would say that experimentation does not equal addiction. Maybe, but a study released by America's National Institute on Drug Abuse found that a fifth of adolescents became addicted to marijuana within three years of first trying it. People with a genetic predisposition towards addiction, but who are deterred from experimentation on account of drugs being illegal, would have that hurdle removed. And just who provides a financial backing to these companies and so, and drives influence, and, and so drives and influences firm strategy? Not benign forces, but multinational corporations who have little interest in consumer good, merely consumer profit. A case in point. Within just two months of marijuana being legalized in Canada, came $1.85 billion in investments made by Ultria, the tobacco giant which makes Marlboros, in Canada's Cronus Group, a cannabis company. Therefore, we are talking about corporate players with a long history of successfully marketing products which we know to be harmful to successive generations. Under these circumstances, how likely is it that they would be content with marketing the mildest, least effective forms of drugs? Even if not all companies initially sold products containing the absolute maximum level permitted according to government, governmental regulation, it would hardly be surprising if the ones that did transpired to have the highest sales, with others duly following suit. Frequent users will naturally find their tolerance increasing and seek longer, and seek stronger or larger quantities to achieve the same result. According to this model, therefore, it would only be a matter of time before the demand for products breached the new legal strength limits and illegal supply chains thrived once again with all their associated negatives. And who are these users most receptive to intoxicating, addictive, but legal substances, most vulnerable to innovative marketing campaigns, even if themse they themselves are technically unable to purchase them by law. Need I say one word, vapes. 10% of 11 to 15 year olds have tried it, the prime age of brain development. Now under this, substitute vapes for ketamine. Surely it is the role of the state to protect its youth from harm, not wrap up the harm in brightly colored wrapping paper and hand it to them on a plate or in spliff. Now, 
One of the reasons proponents of legalization often spotlight is the potential revenue to the treasury via taxation. But the larger the revenue means the larger the sales, means a larger number of consumers using more often. In short, the greater the benefit to the governmental wallet, the more citizens, but the more citizens developing psychosis and depression, the more young people with underdeveloped brains and associated poorer life chances. Perhaps this seems an acceptable trade-off, a convincing argument. I think not. Especially not when you realize that sellers are liable to shift the tax burden onto buyers, making turning to underground, but cheaper, sources of substances appealing, even if you don't quite know what it is that they're selling you or what you're taking. Opposition to legalization does not mean a rejection of decriminalization of needle exchange programs which have worked well in, say, Washington, reducing HIV and hepatitis. It does not mean banning substances like marijuana in a medicinal capacity, where the compounds are chemically defined and administered in a controlled setting by professionals. Opposition to legalization does not mean an endorsement of prohibition or a neo-war on drugs. It means opposition to a free-for-all where the future of our country is preyed on by those who are all too ready to get them addicted to yet another product for profit. I urge you to vote against the motion. Thank you.